All right, let's start then. Okay, so uh, as always, I'd requested some of you to share ideas, thoughts, processes, questions that you wanted me to answer. And I said, if you asked interesting questions, I would be happy to answer them. Unfortunately, no one asked an interesting question. So you guys are now stuck with a topic of my choice, which is called founder puzzles. Now, founder puzzles, oh, sorry, founder puzzles. Okay, so now, do you know what sliders are? Mini burgers, that's right. If you if you like burgers and you want to have lots and lots of them in different flavors, so you want to have the the chicken jalapeno and you want to have the Swiss and mushroom cheese and you want to have the spicy buffalo and you want to have all of them in one go, but you know your stomach is not capable of taking fully loaded three large size burgers, you can order sliders, which are basically mini bite size burgers. Uh, they could be as big as a bite, as big as two bites, and they give you a sense of flavors. Um, so today's session is what we call a slider session from finance, where I'm going to talk about a handful of finance topics that I think are very important, are very commonly misunderstood. They're not, I, so I call them finance because a lot of economics and rational thinking and choice is related to finance. Um, they're actually a lot of common sense, and I think as you go through today's lessons, you'll see that what I call finance could basically be called applied common sense. Um, but for me, uh, this is finance because finance is where I first found them. Finance is where it first made sense to me. And I think finance is where I would place them um, if I had a choice. Okay, so does that sound right? Shall we start? Is that something you're excited to learn? Slider sessions from finance, mini burgers from the world of finance. Purely 100% made from non-food, non-edible grade materials. No meat. All right, so the first question is, how many of you answered the quiz? Do you guys answer the quiz? Let's see, where are the answers for the quiz? Quiz, quiz, quiz. So only 12 votes, where's everybody else? We need more words to break the tie. This is your attendance quiz. So I think the first question, the first question today, the first topic is what we call opportunity cost. How do we decide given choices like these, right? And I think if I were to put the two choices right up here in front of you, um, how many of you have played Civilization, the game? That's three, Abira, Bilal, and Sarfraz, Sharyar, Sayyid. Very good. <laughs> Why Bilal? Why? Why have you been playing a lot? <laughs> okay, fair enough. So if you think in terms of civilization, the game, uh, turn-based strategy games like civilization, uh, basically do what? Who can, who, can, who can introduce us to civilization? Bilal, tell us about civilization. How does civilization work? What does it do? What is the game about? At its heart, what is the game about? Turn-based strategy game, right? But when you say turn-based strategy, what that basically means is that you start off with a given set of resources and a couple of units, and you're supposed to build a world with those resources and those units, right? Uh, Bilal, did your, were your, was your ass kicked royally in the game so far? Are you winning or are you losing? Okay, so, if you really want to get a flavor of how difficult the game is, you know, play at the highest level. And at the highest level, if you make the wrong choices, um, the game gets over really, really quickly. So it starts slow. I think the first first uh, six to seven hundred years, eight hundred years, thousand years, um, you know, you are allowed to live out in peace. But then the impact and the consequences of your choices begin to add up. And pretty soon somebody heavier, meaner, leaner, uh, nast nastier, uh, comes along and destroys you. Okay, so that's civilization, right? Um, a game about choices. So now we applying the same context here to you. Um, you're 21 to 23 years old, and even though in the in the quiz earlier I gave you a choice of $1,500, how about if I reduce it to $1,000? If you have a job that pays $1,000 a month, which is still a lot of money for for Pakistan, and you have a second choice of you know being broke and hungry for another year, which one would you pick and choose? So we've now brought down the stakes 
And then in terms of choices, we're not saying you have to go build a startup or found something, you know, you could actually go to a master's or PhD program. Master's or PhD program is also broken hungry for a year. Actually a PhD program is broken hungry for five years. Abject servitude, slavery, alternate name for slavery, right? You've heard of that, right? Uh, Liber, why do you want control? I'm assuming that was a mistake. Okay, thank you. You just asked me for control of the presentation as if you're not happy with the way this class is going. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. So coming back, coming back to the PhD program, right? Uh, Masters of PhD program is also abject slavery or abject servitude or uh, hard labor, right, for five years. And you go broke and hungry for not one year, but five years. Working for a startup, yes, just as bad. Uh, found, finding, sorry, founding a startup is just as bad. Uh, even taking time out to find yourself, right? Who am I? What do I want to do? What do I want to do this life? And just take a year off to answer that question, you know, roam the world, walk around or even giving back to society. These are all valid choices and reasons. So option B is all of these. Option A is $1,000 a month. Which one would you take? Are you still going to stay the same? Same choices or would anybody want to change their mind? Who wants to change their mind? Okay. Let's reduce the $1,000 to $500, right? So what's the typical salary of a Habib student on graduation? So seventy thousand dollars, okay, sixty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. So seventy. So let's let's do seventy thousand now. Seventy thousand dollars, about roughly speaking, at today's exchange rate, is uh, let me see, four seventy. Say about say about maybe four fifty dollars, right? So you're saying just add the margin, five hundred dollars. Option A pays you a typical salary for a Habib student, which is five hundred dollars. Option B is broken hungry for a year doing any of these. One, two, three, four, five. Change of heart. Rupees, rupees, yeah, rupees, 70,000 rupees. Change of heart, anyone change of heart? We're down to $500. You know, the offer sort of exploded. The $1,500 one's gone. The $1,000 one's gone. We're now down to $500 a month. Would you still go for option A or would you switch to option B? And yes, living in your mom's basement is allowed. I would find a better offer. Okay, fair enough. So what you've just done, what you've just done is you've used opportunity cost to assess. $1,500 is a no-brainer, right? Why is it a no-brainer? Because you're essentially earning three times the average salary of a Habib graduate. So if somebody paid you, made you an offer of three times what you normally make, irrespective of what you're doing, there's a reasonable chance that most rational human beings, most rational people would drop what they're doing and take that offer. Is that a fair assessment? If you're worth X dollars a month and somebody pays you three X dollars a month, there's a reasonable chance that you'd say yes, right? Unless and until you absolutely hated, detested the work that needs to be done or hated, detested the person you were working for or hated, detested the people you'd end up working with. But in most you know, instances, if you were going broke and hungry and I gave you three X what, you, what your market was, there's a reasonable chance that you'd say, that you'd say yes, right? So that at a high level, a simplified level, you know, in a understandable, relatable to graduating computer science seniors is opportunity cost. How do you decide? How do you make a choice, right? And this is fresh out of college, when you're 21 to 23 years old. Now, let's move on. So 10 years have passed, 12 years have passed. You're now 33 years old, right? So you have, you hopefully married, you have a family, you have kids, you have bachas. Um, you've done well work-wise, you know, you've sort of addressed most of your personal and profession itches and you get a offer out of the blue for $10,000 a month, right? Which is a lot of money. $10,000 a month is a lot of money at current exchange rate. That's roughly about 1.7 million rupees a month. Option B again is broken hungry, right? You sort of put your nose down to the ground and you sort of skipped the masters and PhD program dreams, just worked your ass off for about 10 years, you know, and now, you know, you, you have this huge, big 
payday, which is ten thousand dollars a month, which is a nice amount, decent, decent amount. Um, uh, you'd actually get better offers elsewhere in the region, but in Pakistan, ten thousand dollars a month, any time of the day, for a thirty-three-year-old is a respectable salary. So now, would you drop that and take option B? Twelve years later, thirty-three-year-old you gets an offer that pays ten thousand dollars a month. But you're still thinking about option B, so would you? Would you take option B? Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. Well, that's 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 given. That's a given. So we have a lot of switches to B, right? Okay, let's move on to the third scenario. Now you're 45 years old. It's 20 years later, and the offer on the table is a hundred thousand dollars a month. Now that's like a lot of money. That's that's like 1.2 million US dollars a year. And option B is again broken hungry, but you know, in this specific instance, do you actually know what you would want as a 45 year old? So the first question is, do you know what would you want as a 45 year old? Now, my question is, do you know? Do you know what do you want to be? As a forty-five-year-old, that is true. Yes, you would want to rest. Yes, you would want to enjoy. Yes, you will change with time. What you want to be? So that answer is correct. Even though we may be sure about what we want to be twenty years now, by the time we get to that point, our choices, our preferences would have changed. As in, we have a, we have most of us have fair bit of clarity with respect to the next ten years. What do we want in the next ten years? But once you go beyond the ten-year horizon. Things change, preferences change, the environment change, the economy change, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, the beach gets boring after a while. Take my word for it. Uh, yes, you can try it, and you should try it. Certainly, give it a shot. But uh, a private beach at the end of twenty years is going to get get boring. It's good for a vacation. It's good for a break. You can possibly spend a month there. But after that month is done, uh, I think there are going to be challenges and issues. All right. Okay. So, so, how can you know what would you like to do at forty-five? And the right answer is, some of us may, and some of us do, but most of us don't. A large part of the population doesn't. The very few of us, very few lucky, fortunate ones, who know what they want to be at forty-five, um, and some of them, mashallah, are very lucky that they are able to do that when they hit forty-five. Most of us don't. Most of us are not sure. Okay. So back to civilization. So civilization, as a game, basically says allocate resources, make choices. The question is, in real life, when you think in terms of making choices, what's the framework do you use? And that framework for us is opportunity cost. Opportunity cost basically means how can you assess, how do you assess the relative merits or demerits, likes or dislikes, the pros or cons of choices in front of you. So one way of presenting this. Is in terms of career choices, right? Um, and I, the reason why I'm taking the example of career choices, I want to simplify it. I want to make it as relatable as possible. And these are all based on actual people, friends, relatives, family members, acquaintances that I know that I've worked with over the last 30, 35 years. And these are their stories, right? So here, in front of you, right now, is a graph that shows growth in salary. Based on years of service, so this is salary and this is dollars per month. So this is, for example, ten thousand dollars per month, um, and this is service. This is service, right? So this, for example, is thirty-four years of service. Okay. So I've been working since I think I was. Let me see how old was I? I think I've been working since I was nineteen years old, uh, which basically means that I worked for about thirty years. So I would be right about here. Okay. So, on this graph, there are one, two, three, four, five friends. The first friend opted for applied research, and this is his salary. So, when I say growth in salary, what this is showing is that when he started, you know, started at ten thousand dollars a month, and right now he is at sixty thousand dollars a month. 
Then my second friend is a banker who started at a much lower level in year zero when he first started, much, much lower level right now. And he is actually at the million dollars a year benchmark, just under, you know, $100,000 a month in salary. Then my third friend is a consultant who works as a, essentially a technology consultant. Um, that's the specialty that's picked up. And he also started low, but mashallah, he's done well in 15 years. He's now standing at about $10,000 a month. My fourth friend is a technologist. He does support technology support has been doing, has been in the technology support function for about 10 years. And before that was again in the same function for about 10 years. So he's been working for about 20 years and he's also about $10,000 a month. Right. And then my last friend is a founder who earns roughly about $50,000 a month right now. Right. So these are my five friends. What do you see? Something stand out in this graph in front of you? <laughs> yes, old people earn more. That's certainly true. Applied research. So it's a function. Applied research is a function of which field, right? You could take applied research in a field that still leaves you broke and hungry. And you could do applied research in a field which is really, really hot, really, really in demand, uh, seeing a lot of growth and you can take off. So it's not so much applied research is not guaranteed in this specific instance, the person that I'm speaking about did very well because he picked up an area at a point in time and it was just taking off and there was a huge demand for people with his background and still is because you know, the, the area hasn't stopped growing in the last 30 years. So obviously, you know, when we see this, we can clearly see that the bankers have done well, right? But these bankers, are these your normal bankers? Are these your normal bankers that you see at a bank branch where they get to the branch by about 8.30 and they leave by about 5.30, 6 o'clock? Are those the bankers who end up with million dollar paychecks? That's right. That's right. No, these are, these are hardcore bankers, right? Bankers, specialized roles, specialized functions, uh, very bright, very sharp, you know. So the next graph now shows growth and salary by age bracket. So this one was years of service here. It's actual age. So my banker friend is in the 55 to 60 year age group. And he's essentially a, what you'd call a CXO, which means that he is part of the, he's either a CIO or a CTO or a CXO or a deputy CEO or a chairman of the board or so very, very senior banker, right? And done has done very, very well in the sense that by this time, um, and this, this data is about two years old. He's actually jumped much higher now, um, but he's done well, right? So we see a big jump here for him, but in his career, if you notice the biggest jump actually happened from here to here from 45 to 55 is where he essentially more or less roughly doubled his salary. Uh, if you look at my applied research friend, you know, there was steady growth for the first uh, 15 years of his career. Yeah. And then there was a big jump from 35 to about 45. For my um, founder friend, right? This gentleman here, right? Essentially flat line till about 35, 40, and then from 40 to 55, 15 years, big jump. Do you guys see a trend? Are you seeing a trend? Are you seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? That's right, Fatma. You, you've picked up the right trend. So essentially there is a, there is a step up depending on how hard you worked, depending on how well you've done, depending on how lucky you are, depending on, you know, what your specialization in your area of, area of expertise is, Somewhere after 40, there is a magical kick, right? And for some, that magical kick lasts till about 60. So 40 to 60 from a professional, from a growth, from a compensation, from a personal, from a money, from a money in the bank point of view, 40 to 60 are your golden years. You essentially work from 20 to 40 to position yourself for that leap. And then at that cusp, when that door opens, you walk through it and you're in a completely different league. Growth is 
after 40. The kick is after 40. Does that make sense? But then, very natural question is, what happens if you don't make it to the 40s? What happens if you don't make that cutoff? What happens, God forbid, you know, if you sort of hit a health crisis, you know, there are, if you think in terms of the big diseases, right? The big diseases are blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, kidneys, liver, um, muscular, neuromuscular injuries, which includes arthritis, which includes neural disease, lots of other factors. Right? And a lot of these big diseases are essentially a function of your lifestyle, lifestyle choices you make with respect to how you decide to live your life. So this is conditional on one simple assumption and that simple assumption is that you survive. Now when I say survive, I'm not saying you survive as in you live to your 40s. Say you survive as a functional member of the workforce. Because a lot of these roles after 40 are conditional, are contingent on a medical test. If I'm hiring you as a CEO, as a 45 year old CEO, of a large technology company or a large investment bank or a large commercial bank. If I'm taking you on in a role which is important and crucial to this business, I will ask you to go through a medical checkup. And the offer is going to be conditional, it's going to be contingent on that medical test being completely clear. Does that make sense? So if the test is not clear, there's a reasonable chance you will not necessarily get that role. Did you know that? So the big money is not free at all. The big money requires you to be a healthy, fit individual. The big money requires you to be able to work long, hard hours for decades at end. And if health is not on your side, then sadly you can't do that. So with these compensations, then we need to actually make adjustments. We have to add and subtract. What do we add and subtract for? Sometimes it's just bad luck. Sometimes it's good luck, right? A big disease is sometimes just not a, sometimes not even a function of lifestyle. Sometimes it's just, just bad, 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 bad luck. You have to account for asset purchases. How well have you lived your life, right? What have you done with the money? Did you spend that money on those business class tickets to those exotic vacations and locations? Did you spend that money on buying fast and expensive cars? And did you sort of wreck those cars speeding on the highways? Or did you make sensible allocation of capital? And what stuff that lasts and add values and improves your quality of life? Then there are health and disability shocks, right? We've already spoken about, right? So any of the big disease, and I'll just call them BDs, any of the big Ds, big, big Ds or big diseases can set you back significantly and substantially, not just because you'll fail the medical test, but sometimes they come with significant economic consequences. God forbid you're down and you can't work for a year, that just completely derails your career. And there are health costs, other factors, right? Um, then there's education and child support. And then there are family contribution and obligations. Right? So for example, if I think in terms of net worth, right? After making all of these adjustments, after making all of these changes, where do we expect our friends to be in terms of money in the bank? The assets that they own, both liquid and non-liquid, and the liabilities that they owe, net difference between the two. And here we find that my friend, the researcher, has done well the most, simply because he's a simple man, simple choices, Simple preferences, simple tastes. Very bright, very sharp, very shrewd investor. And he's done well. And despite the fact that my banker friend has, you know, has done exceedingly well compared to everybody else, everybody else as far as compensation is concerned, he's led a different life. Um, he's, he's just as simple a man, right? But he's made different choices. And then I have my founder friend who's also done very well. But take a look at the technologist here and the consultants here. What happened here? Why have they not managed to take off or do as well as 
my other three friends. So a handful of things, right? Despite, despite how much fun we make of bankers, senior bankers, qualified professional bankers add a lot of value. Founders at startups that work add a lot of value. Researchers in hot areas add a lot of value. It's not that the consultants and the technologists don't add value. They also add value, right? But there is a huge difference in terms of magnitude in the value added by, let's say, researchers who are doing applied research. Not talking about basic research, talking about applied research, research that gets quantified into business and products that change lives, right? Impact areas. Founders add value and sometimes even bankers add value. So compensation and the amount of money you have in the bank is A, a function of value you add, right? But second, to be fair, there is a hint. The hint is if you go back, if you go back here, right? You can also see that the consultant and the technologist are relatively younger. There's at least a 10 year gap between the founder and the banker and these two. So it's possible that by the time we get, where are we, where's the network, yeah. Uh, yeah, by the time we get, maybe move another 10 years, this graph may have moved up. It still wouldn't have moved as much as the bankers and the founders and the, and the researcher, but it would have moved. But third, I think in terms of compensation, you can also see, where are we? In terms of compensation, yeah, you can also see that while the founder and the researcher and the banker got big kicks, right? Their compensation flattened out. Why is that? Why has the compensation of the technologist flattened out at 45? Whereas the compensation of the banker just took off at 45. No, it's not about promotion. I think it's think about this for a second, right? When you're 45 years old, are you current with technology? Are you good at picking new tools? Are you slowing down? As in you're a product manager or a project manager or even a chief architect, right? But if you're a hands-on technologist and the pinnacle of your career is a chief architect at 45, um, how far and how, are you, how, how high are you going to go? Yes, so technology changes and the ability of... Your, so so there, there are certain areas where you add an enormous amount of value because of your expertise and your background and your skill set. But within those areas, you're competing with a fairly large pool of people that have something similar to offer. So unless and until you do a role change at 45 and become a founder or a researcher or a banker for that matter, which obviously is not possible, right? Um, if you just continue on the arc of being a technologist or a technology support worker or a technology professional, uh, you'll find that your compensation is likely to flatten out. It'll grow. It, it, I'm not saying it's not going to grow. It's going to grow. It's going to grow at, you know, the standard rates of inflation that everybody else's salaries grows at. Your organization, your companies, your businesses will still value you, but they're going to value you a lot less than some of the other people on this list. And that difference and that divide is going to increase over a period of time. As you grow older, you'll find that the specialist roles will rise faster and the standard roles are going to slow down. So, what are the biggest takeaways? Your biggest jump, compensation-wise, wealth-wise, value-wise, net worth-wise, happens when? That's right, 40 plus. So, but to, for you to survive for 40 plus, you have to look after your health. You have to make the right choices. You can only benefit from that growth. You can only open that door and walk through it if you can fit through it or if you can literally walk through it. If you can't walk through it, if you, do, if you, if you can't fit through it, then, then you're stuck. Then, then you don't, everybody else will move on, but you'll be left behind, right? That's two. Three, growth and specialization. They're both linked to each other. 
if you specialize, start specializing early on, higher chance of you growing later on. And again, but that specialization is hit and miss. It's a function of which specialization did you pick? Which area of expertise did you pick? Stuff that you like doing, obviously, right? But also stuff that is hot or is likely to stay hot or is likely to be in demand for the next 15, 20, 30 years. Three, you have to be patient, right? You can't get that million dollar paycheck at the age of 25. You'll have to end up making too many compromises, too many sacrifices if you actually do get it at 25. You have to give up a lot to get that million dollar paycheck at 25. But you can certainly get that at 45 or 50. As long as you're willing to be patient and work hard and grow and improve and add new skill sets and add to your expertise, right? That's It's yours. But it'll take some time. So don't rush into it. And that essentially is a time and place for everything. So I'm going to close this with my question, why health? What do you think this is? Any guesses? My God, this is sad. This is really, really sad. Come on, come on. This, my young friends, is a stent. That's right, Abhi, that's a stent. It's the stuff that they put in your arteries to unblock them. You've heard the word angiography, angioplasty? So again, depending on which type, which factor, anywhere from 70,000 to 250,000 rupees per stent. Not 10 rupees. Yes, it's not It's not 10 rupees. It's quite expensive. So the, uh, the issue is, the reason why it's expensive is it's the material, right? And it's the design and then it's the objective. What are you saying? You're going to take this thing and put this inside someone's heart. And then in that someone's heart, it's supposed to last for at least 15, 20 years. So this piece, whatever this piece is made up of, right? We don't know what's made up of. We'll have to look it up. Whatever it's made up of is material which is used, which is safe for consumption inside a human body part. It's supposed to stay there without killing the patient for the next 15 to 20 years. So the manufacturing cost, it's not about the manufacturing cost. It's about the research, the R&D, the intellectual property that went into identifying both the materials, the manufacturing and design techniques required to manufacture it to a specification which would be acceptable to the medical authorities across 180 countries in this world. Does that make sense? So God forbid if somebody is diagnosed with heart disease and is required to put in a stent, does their, does their expenditure only stop at the cost of the stent? So first there is there are the tests, then there are the doctor's fees, then there are the surgeon's fees, then there's the stent fees, then you deploy the stent, then you need to follow on and then the follow up and then you have to take medication so that your body heals the body doesn't reject the stand, right? Because, and, and your arteries that you've opened up with so much effort, you know, don't get clogged and blocked again. So then it's a lifelong decision, right? And it's not just a question of expenses, it's also a question of there are certain things that you, could able, that you were able to do before that you can no longer do. You have to change your lifestyle. Hence, health has a direct impact on what happens here. All of this assumes that you're a healthy, functional individual. If you don't take care of your health, if you don't take care of your health here, don't take care of your health here, then all of this, all of this goes away. Okay, lesson number two, sun costs. Can you fix, can you fix bad code? If you worked on something for four years, 
and you're not making progress and you're just about ready to quit in your decision to continue working quitting what matters more the amount of time you've put in already four years of your life or how much time do you need to finish it and wrap it off let me put this another way right a lot of you are in your third and fourth year how many of you think that you made a mistake by picking up computer science or double e so now if you found out that this field is not for you, right, I mean, if you finish your program, despite the fact you're putting four years into it, do you think you should continue working in the field or do something else? So if you thought that this is not for you, if you found that out and you once you finish and graduate, do you think you should continue working in this field because you spent four years into it and subject yourself to another 30 years of, you know, misery and torture? Uh, or should you find something that keeps you and makes you happier? What do you guys recommend? Do something else, right? So if, if this is not for you, even though you spent four years into it, don't don't waste any more time in this field. Do something else. Do something else that keeps you happier, keeps you more productive, you know. Find a fit that is something. Yep, there we go. Switch to something else. So now, that's what sunk costs mean. Money, time effort that you've already spent should not be a factor into your choice just like bad code right should you fix bad code yes i agree you can fix bad code but should you and no the code is not yours code somebody else's but it's really really bad code you know code which is bad enough to bring tears to your eye where you say what were you thinking my friend i can't make heads or tails just tell me what you wanted to do and i'll do it again from scratch Rewrite is right, right? So move on. So similarly, sunk cost basically means amount of money you spent, whether it's a million dollars, whether it's four years, five years, 10 years of your life, if it's not working, if it's not likely to work out, if you can see clearly that this is not going to get fixed, then it's better, it's best to close that chapter and move on with your life and do something else. Look to the future, forward, not backwards. That's the lesson from sunk cost. Okay, very good. Now, number three, forecasting the future. How do you build models that forecast performance or results or trends or projections? Starting off with our favorite topic these days, which is COVID-19 growth trends. What does this image or this picture represent? So just like COVID-19, right? in multiple countries, we will all have our own growth paths. And here also you can clearly see that each country has a different model. This is one country, this is one country, this is one country, this is one country. These are all separate countries. Some of them are a family. But how many families are there of models? I can see one, two, three, four, five, at least six separate models. But the challenge and the problem with models is that, you remember the gold graph? We did this in one of our earlier classes. Predicting prices. No? The problem with most models is that as far as prior history, prior data, past data is concerned, they can do a good job of fitting the model to the data. But once you go beyond prior history and prior data, yeah, they're backward compatible. They're not very good when it comes to forward compatibility. Here also with COVID-19, right? All of this is fine and well, but this model is not going to work for this country. So backward compatibility, yes. Goodness of fit with prior data, yes. Accurate predictability, future forecasting, forecast error, no. That's a challenge. And that's because we come back to the fundamental lesson that we've mentioned many times in this course. All models are wrong. Some models are more useful than others. So for example, if I take this trend, right, what do you expect to happen? Once you cross this threshold, if you look at this trend, what do you expect to happen? 
Do you expect if this was prices, do you expect prices to go up? Do you expect prices to come down? Do you expect prices to stay where they are? What would be your guess? A, B and C. Three choices. A, B and C. A, up. B, down. C, stable. Pick a choice. This is a proof of life vote. Prove that you are around in this class and paying attention. Pick an answer. A, B or C. This will count as your attendance. Go now. So we have, how about we have to pick an answer? Can't say down. So say B. So one, two, three, four. You have to pick an answer, guys and girls. I have to pick A, B or C. You can't say down. <laughs> Up or stable. Follow the rules. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one. My God. Okay, so I need to understand this. Everybody who said down, why are you saying down? Why did you pick B? And most of you would be right. You would be right because this is the housing price index from 2008, just after the financial crisis. Most of the world didn't see this coming because the model they had projected this. None of the models in the world at that point in time predicted this. So as I said, all models are wrong, but some models are more useful than others. So in the modeling world, what are some of the smarter things? You know, I see a lot of interest in ML, in machine learning, in data sciences. Uh, in AI, right? I see a lot of interest in these fields, but what are some of the smarter things that you could possibly do to improve your chances, to increase the possibility that you would stand apart from the crowd? What are the smart moves that I'd recommend? So I think the first and the most important smart move is focus on the questions, not the models. Modeling, data modeling, data science, AI, ML is not about building models. It's about answering questions. So focus on the questions. What is the question we're trying to answer? Now the question is, what are the right type of questions? What do they represent? A good question, a great question allows you to frame the analysis. This is a great picture, not because it's, uh, it, it's, it would have been a great picture otherwise also, right? But the picture becomes more interesting and more useful because it's been framed within the hole in a wall, right? So the great questions, the right questions, the right questions to ask, frame the analysis. So what are the right questions to ask? So I think the, the in my list, yes, scope related question, understand. So the first question is, what's the objective? Why are we doing this? Why, what, why do we want to build the model? What's the question we want to answer? So the scope questions are these three questions. What is the objective? Why are we doing this? What do we want to learn? Then there is the user question, right? Who are we doing it for? And how would they use it? Then there is the methodology question, right? What would break the model? What would invalidate our analysis and our results? These are all important questions, right? If you start off your modeling process, by answering these questions, there's a reasonable chance that you'd focus your model, your results, your analysis to a point where it would actually be useful. But if you just went straight to the data and started playing with the tools, would you be able to, do you think you'd be able to be effective? Second, I think the lens matters. So where is the analysis? And sometimes, you know, you have to do it both ways. Sometimes you have to do 10,000 meters. Sometimes you have to do it close up. Sometimes you have to do both. Sometimes you have to do side by side. One year or 30 years. And the lens matters because you can clearly see a range of behavior that clearly indicates that one family of models won't be enough. Third is relative value. Now, relative value is a very interesting question. And, you know, the way that I phrase it is, let's take a look at this graph. What is it showing you? 
the the blue price is these prices right this is the price of gold the green prices is the gold to oil ratio this is a gold to oil ratio right so now do you think what about what's basically showing you is showing you how much would an ounce of gold cost in terms of barrels of oil and here's the quick question the quick question is is gold overvalued relative relative to oil here at this point in time in 2011 yes no maybe is gold overvalued relative to oil prices at this point in time this point in time in 2011 what do you think there no right or there are no right or wrong answers as far as this, this question is concerned i just want to see how you think and what how you digest and process the information in this graph and this image so here if you look at the ratio here the ratio is about 9 which basically means that 1 ounce of gold you could purchase 1 ounce of gold at this point in time in 2005 at roughly or with roughly 10 barrels of oil does that make sense so you could buy 1 ounce of gold with 10 barrels of oil but here you would only buy 1 ounce of gold with about 30 barrels of oil now what do you think you think gold is overvalued with respect to oil oh yeah you're right not 30 20 22 barrels of oil does that make sense so what you've just done is you've done you've put relative value at work you said okay i don't know whether something is overvalued or undervalued i just want to understand whether it would make sense for me to to buy uh gold right now compared to other commodities maybe the other commodities which are more cheaper relative to gold and it would make sense to buy them Yes, you're right, Ahmed. So, put this in a local context, right? Twenty years ago, in two thousand. Twenty years later, in two thousand twenty, how many civics for a thousand yard plot in defence? You know the math. So I'll give you the prices, right? I'll give you the prices. a uh, thousand yard square yard plot in defense in in uh, 2000 would have roughly cost you about let's say 10 million and a civic would cost you about 1 million so how many civics for a plot yeah you Ten civics for a thousand yard plot, right? In 2020, the same plot of land is now worth a hundred million. How much does a civic cost? A civic costs four million. What's the ratio now? So what do you think? Which one is overvalued? Land or civic? <laughs> That's a tough one, right? But you get a sense, right? You get a sense. Relative right value, right? Items of consumption, items of investments, items of use, you can relate them to each other to get a sense of whether something is overvalued or not. Let me ask you a very difficult question, or a very different question, right? What's your yearly fee, tuition fee at Habib University this year in 2020? All right, let's assume 1.2 million. Let's assume 1.2 million. That's fine, right? What was my yearly fee when I graduated from Fast ICS in 1992? Or started Fast ICS in 1990? 
my early fee at fast ICS was 12,000 rupees a year. So between these years, 30 years roughly speaking, 1990 to 2020, the fees has grown how many fold? Fees has grown 100 times. So I paid 12,000 a year for a full two terms of education at Fast ICS in 1990, you paying 1.2 million rupees in 2020. The question is, has your, and this is a hundred fold increase in fees, right? The question is, has your education improved a hundred times? This is the quality of education. The quality of facilities, the quality of tools, the services, process you get today compared to 1990, you know, are they better off a hundred times? No, it didn't. It didn't increase a hundred times, right? And you know, what's a good test? A good test for this is compensation. From compensation point of view, when a fast graduate graduated from fast ICS, his or her monthly salary, and I'm talking about averages, right? In 1990, 91, 92, Averages were about 6,000 rupees a month. So 6,000 rupees a month is, is was the average offer that you know my classmates and those who were senior to me received when they graduated in 1991 or 1992. What's your average compensation here at Habib when you graduate at the end of your four years? 60,000. So while fees have increased a hundredfold, compensation, monthly salaries have only increased 10 times. But do you see what I'm saying, right? The point that I'm trying to make? Relative value. Relative value can answer some really difficult, awkward questions that we would otherwise not have a framework for. And you know, land and civics and education and compensation and gold and oil, these are all instances, examples of this framework at work. So you can translate that in dollar terms, right? Rizwan, that's a great question, right? 6,000 rupees per month at that point in time in Karachi, 1990 we're talking about, right? Would be about $300. And uh, 60,000 rupees today is worth about $400. 6,000 rupees then was $300. 1.2 million rupees today is about maybe $8,000. That actually looks much worse in dollar terms. Yep. You can't win this discussion. <laughs> you can't win this discussion, especially because I've been teaching for the last 25 years. I can tell you whether the quality of education has improved or not because I've been part of the education industry for the last 25 years. Finance, my friend, finance. Finance is a lot of fun. So that's relative value. Okay, so now, now, the takeaway, the key thing that you have to remember, the whole purpose of this exercise, giving you this so much sad data to get depressed about over the next two months, right? The big money in models is not in the models. It's in intuition. It's in building an understanding of what the data, what the connections, what the relationships, what the insights behind the data mean and represent. I really don't care how good you are with technology, how good you are with tools, how many languages you can program and code in, if you can't read translate, interpret, and present data. That requires intuition. If you have intuition, 
and you don't know how to code, I can give you coders that you can work with. But if you don't have intuition, I can't teach you intuition. Now, where does intuition come from? Intuition comes from being wrong. Intuition comes from building models for years till you get a sense of what works and what doesn't work. When things fit and when things don't fit. And when things don't fit, especially when things don't fit, what is the reason why they don't fit? So what should you do? If the value is not in building models, but the value is in building intuition and in being wrong, what should you focus on? If you're interested in being successful in data science and ML and AI, what should you focus on? What should your expertise be in? Come on, come on. Yeah. There you go. That's right. You have to focus on being wrong. The more wrong you are, the more wrong you have been, the more instances of building wrong models you have behind your belt, the more valuable you are as a data scientist, as a modeler, as an ML and AI specialist, because you understand that models break. And because you understand, because you've experienced models breaking, you're more careful in building them. You're more careful in analyzing and reading and working with the results. So for me, you know, when I said this here, when I started this debate in the relative value of education, you really think this analysis is correct? Or have I framed it specifically to start a debate and a conversation? What are my motives? Why did I frame it in this specific context? So yes and no. Yes, yes you can make a case for fast with fast. That's true, right? Um, but fast with fast is not relevant because the fast in 1990 was very different animal from the fast you have now. The fast in 1990 was the Habib of today. When it came to faculty, when it came to thought leadership, when it came to flexibility, when it came to providing platforms and tools and products and ideas to work with, when it came to inspiration, the fast in 1990 was very much like the Habib of today not the fast of today. So the comparison is not so much in terms of a name, the comparison in terms of if you were to go back 30 years and enter yourself into the leading computer science school of Pakistan at that point in time, that school would have been fast. If you were to look at the leading computer science school of Pakistan today, that school would not be fast, that school would be Habib. Two, Again, going back to this analysis, the analysis is only as good as how you frame it, right? So I framed it in a specific context because I want you to ask yourself, is my education 100 times better? And if it isn't, what can I do to make it better? So facilities-wise, yes, certainly, you know, you are generations ahead of what we had at FAST. Faculty-wise also, I think you're very lucky. I think in some areas you're comparable, in some areas you're better, in some areas you're worse. It's a function of what, right? Um, in curriculum point of view, your generation is ahead of where fast was because you know you have liberal arts, you have thinking, you have writing, you have questions, you have history, you have context, right? We didn't have all of that. We just focused on computer science. In terms of talent also, you know, we had a great group of people, but you also have a great group of people. In some areas, you're actually comparable. Um, in some areas, you're better. A hundred times better? No. But if you think in terms of why the cost of education has gone up or grown up or has expanded itself so much in the last 30 years, some of it has to do with inflation, but some of it also has to do with how much we've learned about how to deliver quality CS education. All right, all right. So now, so be wrong. And be wrong basically means do stuff with your hands. Whatever you want to build, models or otherwise, do stuff with your hands, be wrong. Be wrong is very valuable. 
Okay, next item, optionality. What is optionality? What does that mean? Flexibility, that is right. That's what I'm looking for. So for example, if you're standing here today, right? And you have a couple of choices. Your choice is graduate. Choice is be a banker. Choice is research. Choice is consult. Choice is be a technologist. Choice is be a founder and choice is PhD. These are all choices, right? You're open to all of them, but obviously you can't do all of them. But you're interested, right, in exploring. You're saying, you know, Jawad spoke about bankers making a shitload of money. I'd like to see what it's like being a banker. And if I want to be a banker, then uh, how do I get into banking? I have a technology degree, right? I have a computer science degree. I could join a bank, just work for a bank. Or I could possibly work for a technology company that works with banking solutions. And if I could work for a technology company that works with banking solutions, then I could explore banking because I'd end up working with banks and bankers. I'd explore the consultant part because I'd be consulting for banks and I'd understand what it takes to be a technologist. So in one choice, one choice, the structure of that choice is what? I'm working for a technology company that works for the banking industry in Pakistan. I have crossed out one, two, three options. I now understand. I'll have a choice. I'll have the option to explore three industries in one go. And then, you know, after I work for them for a year, I'll decide whether I want to be a banker, whether I like working with banks, whether I like working in and being around bankers, whether I like being a consultant, whether I like being a technologist, or whether this is not for me. And if it's not for me, then I'll decide. And then I'll focus, you know, whether I want to go out and do a PhD or higher education or do something else with my life. So optionality basically means flexibility, right? And the reason why flexibility and optionality are important is flexibility becomes important when you are faced with uncertainty. So if you think of what has just happened to us, right, in the last six to eight weeks, what happened? We shut down the university, we sent everybody home, and then we said, okay, we'll do online education. But to do online education, there are certain requirements, right? The first requirement is you must have a decent broadband connection. You must have reliable electricity. You must have a laptop at home. And if you're teaching, then you must actually have a quiet area where you can teach for six hours in a day without being disturbed. So if you had all of this, you could very easily go from this world, which is a, a instructor-led classroom model, to this world, which is a world apart, which is a remote, sorry, remote learning model, remote learning model. So none of this would be possible without broadband, electricity, laptop, and a quiet room. Now, I had a quiet room because I'd worked from home before, and I quite often work from home, so I'm used to working from home, right? So not too much of a transition. I had broadband because, you know, I, <laughs> I like having a fast internet connection. It's important for retaining and maintaining my sanity. I have a laptop because I've been working with laptops for a long time. And I have a quiet room because it's the study that I work off. But if you didn't have any of these, if you don't have that flexibility, do you think it would have been easy to switch from a classroom model to remote learning model. So optionality sometimes means that you spend a little extra, you do a little bit more, you put a little bit extra effort so that if the time comes for you to do something else, if the time comes when it's proven that what you were looking at, what you were doing, what you were trying to do was wrong, was incorrect, was off, you have an option. 
you can try something else so going back to a career choices right for example you go and work for this technology company that sells solution to banks you work with them for a year and at the end of that one year you realize that you hate bankers or you hate banking or you hate software or you hate implementation that bank or you just hate technology you love playing games you love studying you love programming you love solving challenges but consulting interacting working with public customers doing client side implementations handling client issues and problems and challenges and questions and queries is not your kettle of fish but because you took out the time you said i'm going to spend a year trying to figure out whether this is for me or not before i lock myself into a career before because you took that time out and because in that time out you realize that this was not for you you actually have the choice to not do this but what if you hadn't taken out that time what if you said you know javad said bankers make a shit load of money i'm going to go do an mba from wherever i can get an mba from and then go join a bank and work for a bank for the rest of my life so you drop out of computer science you leave computer science you go to an mba you go to a place where you know get an mba in about 2 years you spend two more years of your education and at the end of those 2 years you know you end up working for a bank and within the first year you find out that you hate banks now what do you do you 3 years in So would it be better to just spend that one year working in a role where you have more data, you have more information before you commit, or is it better to just commit and start off the bat? When is optionality really valuable? You know, you spend a little extra, right? You spend a little bit more. When does the value of that little bit more really becomes phenomenal? Optionality becomes valuable. when uncertainty increases just the fact that we were able to switch to online learning did what i know i hate teaching online and i know some of you really hate learning and studying online right uh, it's not the same as a classroom but it's better than not doing anything at all so now that we've done a month of online classes what is that done god forbid if the university doesn't open in june god forbid god forbid right god forbid god forbid doesn't open in june do we have an option yes there we go we have an option right now when was the right time to explore that option the right time to explore that option was now is to see guys you know worst case worst case worst case if we have to shut down for another 3 months then what happens to the graduating class can we offer them anything at all is there any saving grace at all and yes that saving grace is the online option we've explored the online option so that we have an option god forbid things don't open up in june and if they do and we can take online classes or we can take real live instructor led classes on campus that is great that's phenomenal news but if it god forbid god forbid god forbid they don't then we have a choice we have an option so optionality becomes more valuable as uncertainty increases faced with uncertain times look for flexibility i'm going to skip this this is homework you can when you when i send you the slides you can go through the slides and see now another way of handling optionality and handling uncertainty so take small bets so you know the example that we gave earlier of go work for a technology consulting company that works with banking solutions is a small bet you said okay before i go to an mba i'm going to try this out see whether i like working for banks or not and if i don't i'll do something else at least i'll have the choice right to do something else so rather than doing an mba and spending all the money i have on doing something which is not something that i may like right before i spend all that money and time and effort i would rather just try something for a while to see whether this is for me or not so small bets allow you to get more data get more data allows you to make informed choices informed decisions so here's an example here's an instance of a case of 15 parameters right 
and the choice is you know my name is Jawad Ahmed Farid I run a technology company once upon a time my team came to me and said Jawad we have these 15 parameters that we need to store what would you prefer would you prefer that we code them and put them in the code or would you prefer that we create a database table and in that database table we add these 15 rows what's your preference what do you recommend what do you think I said what would you do would you store these 15 variables and parameters in code as variables right not constant as variables or would you create a database table and what we're building we're building a calculation engine the question was that calculation engine would use some of these values but what was more efficient was it more efficient to store these values in in uh, in uh, in a table or was it more efficient to store these values in code tell me what would you do if your team came to you would you put them in a table or in a variable is certainly more faster every time you run a calculation it's possible that you may change the results um, it's also possible that you only set them up once in a while and not change them at all. It wasn't just 15, right? The 15 very quickly grew. So that's general setting, email setting, day count mapping, and this is just the simulation parameter settings. And there's a stress test parameters, and there's minimum capital requirement, then there are ALM buckets. And then there were other screens and other parameters. You see that's one, two, three, four, five. And then there were yet even more parameters. By the time we were done, I think there were about 2,000 plus parameters that had to be stored. They were all stored in a ta in a table. We didn't do this. we didn't do the variables. We did we did the tables. Now, why did the tables make sense? Because sometimes, sometimes, it made sense to store the parameters you'd chosen store the parameters you've chosen as a profile so that you could run a deck of reports against a standardized set of stored parameters so you don't have to enter all of these values again by hand every time you ran a report it was faster more efficient to store them as a profile as a default profile and what that default profile would basically do is make it easier for you to generate a report really really quickly without worrying about the choices because you simply say okay last month end I ran this set of reports using these parameters just use that same profile run these reports all over again for this month's data and I know for a fact because they're coming from the same profile that the parameters would be the same I don't have to worry about it does that make sense yeah you could learn from data So what was this? This is optionality. This took, at the point we took this decision, it, this took a little, didn't take a lot, took a little extra time. What a little extra time? We had to design a database table. We had to write queries to put data in, pull data in. That was it, a little bit of extra effort. But what that little bit of extra effort did was it made it possible for us to deliver phenomenal value. Much more importantly, you know, because this became a design element, then the team knew for a fact, anytime a parameter comes, Jawad will have the same answer. Store it in a table. There's no sense in even asking him. Store it in a table. That's what he's going to insist on. Don't try to put it in a variable. If you put it in a variable and he finds out, he's going to lose his cool. He's going to get really, really mad. Store it in a table. This, that became the design philosophy. So everything that we did linked, hooked, connected with a table. And what that then did was that when we moved from Karachi to Dubai, when we took our software, when I took our technology from Pakistan to the Middle East and from the Middle East to Nairobi in East Africa, the tables were already there. All you had to do Think about this for a second. All you had to do was because we put that in the table and because we we'd expose these variables to the users to configure the system, 
you didn't need to touch code to port the system from one market to the next you didn't need to touch code all you had to do was log into the screen as a user change the values change the variables for the market you were working in and you were done your calibration your configuration your implementation were infinitely simplified that's optionality for you that's flexibility for you started off with a design choice in a case of 15 parameters spend a little extra to create phenomenal value both in terms of savings in terms of usability in terms of user experience in terms of implementation in terms of integration comes specialization and scale which should come first specialization or scale should you specialize first should you scale first pick one that's right specialization is first specialization comes first so here four examples right three examples not four three examples model building i built my first model in an, in a spreadsheet and at that point in time it wasn't lotus 1 to 3 it was called it wasn't called excel it's called lotus 1 to 3 because lotus 1 to 3 was a lotus product that was the original first excel spreadsheet that became mainstream built my first excel spreadsheet sorry lotus spreadsheet in 1987 how many years is that? 33 years ago. 33 years of building models. 32, 32, 33. Okay. Uh, teaching. Ran my first class in 1995. How many years is that? About 25 years. Ran my first article, published my first article in 1986. How many years is that? 34 years. Have you heard about the value of a network? The value of the network equation? You all have access to Google, right? Look up Metcalfe's law. Answer the question. Value of a network. What determines the value of a network? If you have more nodes, how much does the value of the network goes up by? Square of the number of nodes, that is right, n to the power 2, n to the power 2, right? So that means if you have a network with 10 nodes versus a network with 100 nodes, what's the difference? This is 10 to the power 2, this is 100 to the power 2. How many zeros is that? This is 100, this is 10,000. If you add 100 nodes, or even 90 nodes, you increase the value of the network by how many times? An idea becomes more valuable as it is exposed to more people. An idea is a network. The value of an idea increases, it improves when more people see it. If less people see it, the idea is less valuable. It improves because everybody who sees it comments on it, critiques it, improves it. Just that engagement, just that transition, this is a transaction of exchanging ideas and opinions increases the value of the underlying idea. So take this thought, hold this thought, right? The idea is a network. Take it back. So 33 years of building models. What does that mean? Customers, clients, students, teachers, partners, people that I've worked with. 33 years of building a network. And this is what? This is financial modeling. This is pure finance. Then, 25 years of teaching. That's another network which started off with computer science but very quickly by the time we got to 2003 about 16 years ago switched to finance then the third network which is writing and publishing right started in 86 by the time we got to 2010 so about 10 years ago switched to finance so if I bring three separate networks modeling teaching 
publishing together and they're all focused on finance what have I just done how many nodes have I added to my network I've increased the value right? but by how much I've merged three separate distinct network the youngest of those networks is 10 years old the oldest of those networks is 33 years old so I've not added a single node or two nodes or three nodes I've added complete entire networks into that finance focused network so if you want to scale once you specialize right so specialization is finance the specialization is finance right that's my specialization right you will have your specialization it takes years to build specialization don't build it in isolation make sure that you're building a network side by side with it and when the time comes for you to scale use the network effect to scale when you bring specialization to networks you create tremendous value but for this to work it's important that you meet two conditions one you must have a specialization two you must have a network if you have both you won you have won you haven't make sense does that make sense all right last lesson last lesson is fixed cost and variable cost right hacking the baselines and let's start with my favorite Emirates airline what is this what is this aircraft called so gorgeous aircraft what's it called <laughs> yes, it's called the Emirates A380. All right, how much does an A380 cost? How much does an A380 cost? Take a guess. Biggest passenger plane, right? There are two decks, a lower deck and a upper deck. And it normally flies, this is business and this is economy. But sometimes it also flies in a total economy configuration where both classes are economy. So if you have a if a, if you have a both deck economy configuration, two deck economy configuration, how many passengers can you fit in an A380? 800. So 400 million dollars and 800. Now assume for a second that Emirates rents it out. Emirates leases the A380, right? How much do you think Emirates pays per per day, just in terms of leasing cost for these A380s? If you just think in terms of an operational cost, you know, the amount of money an A380 is supposed to generate every single day to break even on the cost of purchase and the cost of operation and the cost of fuel, right? How much do you think the A380 costs to run? Okay, fair, fair estimate. It's about a million dollars, million, million dollars a day, right? To break even. How many A380 does Emirates airline have? How many did they buy? How many A380s did Emirates Airlines bought? I'd say a safe estimate would be 150. Emirates Airlines, as let's assume for a second, Emirates Airlines bought 150 A380s. What are those A380s doing now, right now? Where are they? They're sitting on the ground, gathering dust at the way airport. Yes, they parked. And if they parked, how are they generating a million dollars a year, a million dollars a day in revenue, revenue that they need to break even? <laughs> They're not. So 150 A380s 
costing a million dollars a day to operate, roughly speaking, right? That's the ballpark figure we've come up with. Basically means what? How much money is Emirates losing just on the A380 fleet? A hundred and fifty million dollars a day. That's fixed cost. If you're not working, if you're not operating, if you're not running a business, you're not serving your customers, what would it cost you to exist? What would it cost you to breathe? To survive being a business? Higher your fixed cost, the lower your ability to handle uncertainty the lower your ability to handle shocks to the system lower your fixed costs higher your flexibility higher fixed costs lower flexibility but you'd be surprised how quickly we add a fixed cost you know that's a separate lecture just on fixed costs we could spend maybe a full semester on discussing fixed costs within the technology industry but we won't talk about the technology industry just as yet we have another example what is this place <sighs> Tell me, what is this place you see in front of you? Yeah, I'm not talking about the beach, uh, even though the beach is beautiful, right? No, it's not Bali. <laughs> A pub, where in the world do you live? See, you never looked this good. Japan, no. This is the four season at Kosumai in Thailand. I shot this picture, right? I was standing where wherever I was standing to shoot these pictures. So this is something I saw with my eyes. It's gorgeous. But it's a resort. Do you think it's any different from an airline? It's not any different from an airline because all of this land, all of these buildings, just like Emirates Airline, have been financed, have been leased. There's rent. Think of it as rent. There is rent that needs to be paid. So normal environment, the place is fully booked. So in, in peak season, the place is fully booked. You can't get a room. You can't get a place. You have to wait for three, four months. But now, at this point in time, there are no guests. There are no tourists. There are no visitors. So if there are no guests, no tourists, no visitors, and no flights, how do you cover rent? High fixed costs. High fixed costs are bad news for businesses in trouble. High fixed costs are bad news for businesses when things change without notice. High fixed costs are a challenge in times of uncertainty. Why? Because high fixed costs restrict, restrain your ability to respond. They reduce your flexibility. Make sense? So how do all of these high fixed costs. How do the high fixed costs of our friend, the Emirates Airline A380 and the Four Season Resort in Koh Samui, which is a beautiful place to be, I'd highly recommend it, compare with the high fixed cost of a fisherman friend from Dodaria in Karachi? They do. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. You're right. Businesses have fixed costs, but fixed costs have other challenges. So you have fixed costs, you have to be very, very you have to be very careful, you have to be very clear in terms of your plans when things change a turn for the worse, take a turn for the worse, when things take a turn for the worse. Yep, as your business grows, your fixed cost increases, right? So our fisherman friend also has fixed costs, right? His fixed cost is the cost of his boat. But luckily for him, you know, the boat is about 30 years old. And because, you know, 30 years old, he's already paid out both the rent or the lease payment. So the boat essentially for him is free. 
but there are some variable costs and variable costs are the cost of his staff the cost of his fuel the cost of his parking spot at the harbor right the cost of maintenance the cost of repairs right cost of the fishing license those costs are there but they're not as big as large as the cost of the boat which means he would possibly be able to be a lot more flexible in these times than the four season at Kosumai or then Emirates Airline. Emirates Airline is bleeding cash hand over fist and will continue to beat cash will continue to bleed cash till the current crisis is over till travel returns to normal. How long do you think it's going to take for travel to return to normal? You think Emirates Airline can survive 150 million dollars a day worth of loss every day for the next two years? $150 million a day is a big amount. It's a large amount. All right. So fixed cost, software business. How does this work? In the software business, your unit economics are a function of certain key decisions. So your profit margin is a function of whether you run a product business or a service business. A service business, high fixed cost. Product business generally depends on what the product is and how long you've been at it and how long you've been doing it. Could be low or high fixed cost. Marginal cost, how long, how much does it cost you to serve one new customer, ship one new order, process one new transaction that's marginal cost what's your marginal price how much would you sell one extra unit for one extra hour of service one extra unit of product break even break even volume all of these you can see clearly see are a function of what your fixed costs are versus your variable costs right so fixed costs are costs doesn't matter whether you run a business or not. It doesn't matter whether you're open for business or not. You have to pay them. So my office is shut down. Nobody's there. Nobody's working there. Nobody's there, right? Nobody can go there because you're supposed to be shut down, shut down, shut down, right? But does that mean I don't have to pay rent? Can I tell my landlord that, you know, uh, office is locked down. Nobody's working. We aren't using it, but so we can't pay rent. You think that's how it works? So fixed cost, right? I have fixed costs. Now, the higher the fixed cost I have, the more trouble I'm in. The lower the fixed cost I have, the less trouble I'm in, right? Now, my employees are also my fixed costs. But luckily for me, you know, most of us are comfortable enough, actually have the flexibility and the comfort to work from home. And it's a small team, not a large team. You don't have hundreds of thousands of employees. We just have a handful of employees and all of them work from home. So even though my employees are my fixed cost, but because they're working, because they're functioning, you know, it's not a write-off. They're not sitting at home twiddling their thumbs. They're working. Working very hard. In fact, you know, we've all been working harder than we've ever worked in the last eight weeks since this whole episode started. So the reason why the software business is such an interesting business is that software business, it's possible to end up in a model and this is a rarity where you have not just low fixed costs, you also have very low variable costs, very low marginal costs, which essentially then makes you, turns you into a gold mine. Now this is rare, this is not common, not everybody gets it right. A handful of us who've gotten it right, a handful of us who've done it right and done it well, have done exceedingly well when they've been able to scale their low fixed cost, low variable cost operations to higher volumes. They've literally printed money hand over fist. So difficult to get right, rare, not that common. But if you're lucky enough, if you're smart enough, if you're bright and sharp enough to do this, you'll find that the software business is a very interesting business. If you get this balance between fixed costs and variable costs right. Okay, good code versus bad code. And this also will skip.
so I just want to now wrap it all together and bring it all together and think in terms of connecting the ideas that we've discussed. So the first idea that we spoke about was opportunity cost, which basically meant choices have consequences over the long term and the lens that you're looking for in terms of long term, long term is about 20 years. Then we spoke about sunk cost. We said, listen, if you've made a bad choice, you made a bad call, made a mistake, it's all right, it's okay. What you've done, what you've, what you've lost, what you've spent is gone. No, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Walk away, look forward, look to the future, move on with your life, right? There is a life in front of you, look at that. Third, we spoke about predicting futures and framing questions. Framing questions both in terms of asking the right questions and understanding, you know, why models break. Then we spoke about optionality and uncertainty right? and how that becomes valuable very, very quickly in times of both uncertainty, specifically hard times with uncertainty. Right? Then you spoke about using small bets to get more data so that we can more, make more informed decisions. And then we spoke about specialization and scale. Specialization takes time, right? but when we link it to this concept of an idea as a network, you know, it becomes really easy to scale with specialization, right? And then finally, right, towards the end, when it came to scale, right? So scale is a function of fixed costs, right? Software business is an interesting business because it allows you to do interesting things with both low fixed costs and low variable costs. And yes, we have software businesses that have high fixed costs and high variable costs. But we also have software businesses that have low fixed costs and low variable costs which makes it a really interesting business to explore, especially in times like these when you have an enormous amount of uncertainty. So given a choice of starting an airline right now, such as Emirates and ending up with a fleet of 150 A380s that cost a million dollars a day to run and starting a software business where you can all work from home, which one would you pick? You should only add fixed costs when you have guaranteed volume of orders in front of you. And then I think the funny part, the funny part that I left out because I wanted to save it till the end, funny part is in all of this discussion, despite the fact that you're in a technology company, did we speak about technology? Did we speak about tools and platforms? No. Technology is just one small part of the overall equation. A larger part of the equation is the fact that you're running a business. And running a business has nothing to do with technology. Running a business has everything to do with maintaining a balance between sales, between orders, between volumes, and your cost structure. And your cost structure is a function of the balance between fixed costs and variable costs. If you have high fixed cost, you're screwed when it comes to times of uncertainty, hard times. If you have low fixed cost, you have a chance. You have a chance because you have flexibility to respond to uncertainty, to the hard times. If you don't have fixed cost, you don't have a shot. You have a chance. Unless and until you have really, really deep pockets. Things are not looking good, my friend. All right, G. So now, takeaways and questions. What did you learn? Kya si khaapne? Or more importantly, and it's a big question, kuch samaj mein aaya ya nahi samaj mein aaya? Did you understand anything or everything or you didn't understand nothing? Very good, Sayyid. Very, very good. Expertise before expansion. Flexibility is good. Flexibility is actually the best possible thing you can get. So if you can keep, spend a little extra, just a little extra, to keep your options open in times of uncertainty. It's the smartest money you'll spend. It'll, it'll feel like a lot. You know, you'd say, why am I putting this extra effort? Why am I doing this work? Is it really worth it? Do we? Can we really afford to spend this much extra, I just save that money. Don't save the money, spend a little extra, keep your options open. If you're uncertain about the future, if you're uncertain about your choices, that extra bit will go a long way. Now I spoke about the network effect, right? The network effect also means that as you bring ideas together, as you apply them together, as you put them together in a single framework, what do you do? You collectively increase the value of all of these ideas. 